The service is brought to you by Coca-Cola. <laughs> hey, welcome. If you're uh, Am I on? Can you hear me? Am I? Am I on? Can you hear? You are this week. Oh, <laughs> just checking after last week. <laughs> this is Lincoln Smith. He tried to be with us last week via video. It was a silent movie, which is the best kind. So that was, was it worked out real well. Hey, if you're a guest, welcome to Twickenham this morning. We're glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. If you are looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. And if you're passing through, we'll pray for safe travels for you. Just glad you're here. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and you can place that in the collection plate just a little bit later on. If there's a prayer concern, indicate that on the card and we'll be praying about those as early as tomorrow morning. So just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. There is a connection between the Coca-Cola video and what we're doing this morning. I'm, first of all, I'm happy that Charlie Brown finally got something. He finally won, and uh, Stewie and Underdog didn't, so I'm glad about that. But the title of that particular ad that Coke came out with a few years ago is called Mine, M-I-N-E, -E, Mine. Advertisers don't do stuff unless it connects with the culture because they're trying to influence us to do something. And the fact that Coke comes out with an ad about two people fighting over a thing and calling it mine says something about our culture. We're starting a new series today called uh, Right on the Money, Me, My Stuff, and God. And today it's all going to be about perspective, how we see things. You'll hear that in the songs, you'll hear that in the scriptures, you'll certainly hear that in the sermon. And then throughout the message this morning, you will be focused on George Washington's eyes. I'm curious to see how long it takes to creep people out for George Washington to be staring at us all through this series. But that the perspective is what's really important. That's where we'll be this morning. Glad you're here. Let's stand, let's sing, we'll have a time of praise, and we'll get into our worship. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you. this morning. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus.
The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares with you. Lord, you servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward, but who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Be seated as we take our offering. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior. Jesus. 
Good morning. Can I just say, let's give it up for the praise team, because they sound great. I can even chime in, and it still sounds good, so that's impressive. So I'm going to quote a, a great philosopher of the 20th century. Um, we are going to Oma, I'm sorry, we're going to L.A. via Omaha, so just stay with me, all right? So I have in front of me a book. This book is uh, named The Noticer. It's by a guy named Andy Andrews. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. Uh, it's a great book. Um, the story is about this drifter. He's a, a black guy. He's got a gray beard. Uh, and nobody knows where he came from. And his name is Jones. And when you see Jones, you always see trouble. So uh, uh, let's see here. I'm going to read some of the, the settings you find him in. Poverty a failing marriage, old age, lost dreams, a failing business, and an unsure future. And the gift that Jones has is he brings perspective. He uh, talks with these folks and he reminds them of the bigger picture and they change their view of the world and oddly enough, good things happen. So um, if you haven't read it yet, um, just one little secret that I'll give away with you. Jones just might be an alliteration for somebody else's name who starts with the letter J. Just saying that could be there. So what's that got to do with us? Well, Jody is going to talk to us today about a passage out of Matthew. It's uh, chapter 6, verses 19 through 24 is, I believe, where he's going to be. And that is right smack in the middle of the um, Sermon on the Mount, which is by far uh, the premier sermon when it comes to perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna read some title headings here. I'm not gonna actually gonna read the passage, but you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about here. And this is just from the page that the uh, verses come from. Adultery, divorce, oaths, eye for an eye, love for enemies, giving to the needy, prayer, fasting, my personal favorite, treasures in heaven, do not worry, and judging others. This is some deep stuff that's going on here. And what we hear is God's perspective on it. I don't know about how it works in y'all's life, but here's how it works in my life. If I'm walking through something with somebody else, it's strangely easy for me to capture their perspective. And sometimes I can even speak some words of wisdom in their life without them getting too mad at me. But when it comes to looking in that mirror and where I've got to find the perspective, I struggle. And to say that I struggle is an understatement. I struggle mightily. So again, what's that got to do with today and what we're about to do? Well, I want to remind you of something as we're about to take this communion. Jesus became fully man, fully human. Jesus was just like me and you. Jesus was tempted. Jesus was hungry. Jesus was cold. Jesus walked this earth, he gave up his kingdom in heaven, and came down here and became just like me and you. And on the day that he died, after he had been beaten, tortured, spit on, and been forced to carry his cross up to the place where they were going to kill him, this is the kind of perspective that he was willing to give. One of the last things that he says before they put him on the cross is this, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. I don't know about y'all, but that's the kind of perspective that really draws, gives me strength and power. So what we're about to do is remind ourselves that the same spirit that lived in Jesus, that gave him the power to do those things, is right here with us, and we can give us the same power no matter what we're walking through. So just to ask you to think about that and uh, keep that perspective on heaven. Bow with me, please. God, you are good. God, you loved us right from the beginning. You knew exactly what we would do and exactly what our hearts desire, but you still made a plan that would allow us to have this conversation today. And for that, I am eternally grateful. God, I just ask that your spirit just hover upon us this morning and just give us the strength for whatever we're facing, because I know the troubles are real out there today. Just... Be there with us and just help us remember that you are there and that you are our strength and that we can take comfort from that. 
I humbly pray this in Jesus' name. Tell of the cross where they with me again. God, we're about to take this cup, which represents the blood that Jesus spilled for me and everyone in this audience so that we could have this time. Lord, just please help us to remember the gravity of the situation, but also the peace and the joy in the situation that Jesus paid that price in full for us again so that we can now commune with you Lord and just help us to hang on to the strength it provides and hang on to the forgiveness and let go of every part of the sin that tied us to this world uh, God you are so good to us and we just thank you for sending your son to die for us and we pray this in his blessed name amen
Lord, we are grateful for the blessings of the day and the perspective of our worthlessness. We ask your blessings on Jody as he brings your word to us this morning and that we all might somehow find a different view of, of you and how things are going in our lives. We're grateful that we've been able to share in communion as family. And now, may our worship continue to be a blessing to you as you have blessed us so richly. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name and all that agree say, amen. amen. Let's stand together. I will worship. You can uh, turn to the book of Matthew if you want to. Matthew chapter 6 is where we'll be this morning. A couple of program notes as you're kind of settling in here. Uh, a bunch of our folks are away at camp today. So if you're looking around and you're seeing there's some empty faces, empty seats here. We got a bunch of people at camp. They'll be coming home this afternoon. So I would invite you to pray for tomorrow. No, some of them are coming home today, trust me. So. <laughs> coming home tomorrow. Uh, pray for safe journeys. They've had a great time. We're at a new facilities this year, and it's really, really nice. I think uh, a lot of folks are going to be really interested in going back next year. The other thing is that you need to remember is that we are adding some new shepherds, and you are supposed to be nominating them, which means you need to get those nomination forms in. There's some in the lobbies, or you can come by the office. We need those tomorrow morning. That's the, we're going to when we need to compile those, or tomorrow sometime is our last day to turn those in. So uh, be thinking about that, praying about that. And if you haven't turned yours in, turned your nomination form in yet, please, please, please do so. Okay, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, the, the first thing I want to tell you about this series is that it is not going to be about giving, okay? So I think a lot of folks hear that we're going to be talking about money, and they go, oh, great, here we go. You know, beat us up for four weeks about our giving. And this is not really about giving. Giving will come up in the series because that's kind of hard to talk about money without talking about generosity, but that's not what this series is about. Um, we're not about to start a building fund, or if we are, nobody has told me. So I would be a little surprised if that was coming up. We're not about to begin a capital campaign. 
Uh, that's not in here. And we're not worried about the budget. I mean, we're not quite where we want to be, but we never are this time of year. And by the time we get to the end of the year, we're where we need to be. So none of that's the issue. What we're concerned about and why we're going to focus on this series, uh, focus on money in this series, is we're concerned about bringing every aspect of our lives under the lordship of Jesus. And that includes our finances. Now, everybody knows that how we treat other people is an important part of what it means to be a disciple. That how we treat other people needs to be submitted to Jesus. Developing healthy, loving relationships is a part of what it means to be a disciple. In fact, last week, we even, uh, or was it the week before, we even talked about one of the one of the qualifications for being an elder or a shepherd was we asked the question, are his relationships healthy? Because if a, if a leader's relationships are not healthy, then you kind of wonder, can they lead a church, an organization, whose one of its stated goals is deep, healthy, loving relationships? And so everybody knows that. We believe that Jesus has got something to say about forgiveness. I mean, Tom, just a minute ago, great great reflection this morning during the Lord's Supper. And, and one of the things Tom reminded us of is that on, on, on the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they don't, they don't know what they're doing. So we, we know that he's got something to say about forgiveness. We know that Jesus has got something to say about ethics and honesty and authenticity. Everybody knows that our morality needs to be submitted to Jesus. Who we are and how we live sexually matters. It's a part of what it means to be a disciple. Now, we don't always succeed at submitting to him in all those areas of our lives, but everybody knows we should. But then you start talking about money, and everybody's like, whoa, 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 Jesus, stay in your lane, okay? This is personal, and they're right, it's personal, but they're wrong because we are wrong because this really is in Jesus' lane. What we do with our money, how we respond to our money, our perspective on our money, and all of the stuff our money can buy us, whether we have that stuff yet or not, that's all in his lane. He cares about all that. Here's the thing a lot of people don't know. Jesus talked about greed 10 times more than he warned about sexual sin. In, in, in the Bible, he talked about greed and attitudes toward money 10 times more than he talked about sexual sin. Now, you think back on all the sermons you've heard and the books you've read and the blogs and the podcasts and the bulletin articles and everything, all the media you've consumed, which do you think the church has talked more about, sexual sin or financial sin? Let me help you with an answer to that question. There are zero preachers who have developed an international following telling people they can do whatever they want to do sexually and still go to heaven. But there are hundreds and thousands of preachers who will tell you that God wants you to make tons of money and give some to me. There's a lot of people out there. So it's no wonder that nobody ever thinks they're guilty of greed. Honestly, when was the last time you heard somebody say, man, I'm just so struggling with materialism. I just, I'm so out of step with Jesus when it comes to my finances. Nobody, never, nobody ever says that. Money's greed and our attitude toward money is kind of like a vampire you can't see it in the mirror you, you see it in other people right because they're greedy and they got issues but I'm just trying to get by so one, I want to look at this passage with you Matthew chapter 6 this is a part of Jesus famous sermon on the mount or as I like to sometimes call it that time Jesus got up in everybody's grill because he does he just gets all into everybody. So we're going to look at uh, chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. We're going to read down to verse 24. And then here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we'll read the passage. I want to pray over it. And then we're going to talk about two verses out of this passage. And then I'm going to give you seven questions. Okay? That's how we'll go this morning. So here we go. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. 
Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. My favorite word in that whole section is vermin. I just love that word. I think that's kind of interesting. Anyway, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We'll talk about that one next week. The eye, here's the weird part. This is the part we're going to talk about this morning. Verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Let's pray. God, thank you for this sermon that Jesus preached so many years ago, and we pray that we will hear it well, that we will hear it um, as you intended it to be heard, and that we will apply it. Open our hearts and open our eyes that we may see you and the truth that you want to bring us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this is one of those audience participation questions. And it's always dangerous because you never know how it's going to go. This one's, this part of the, the question is not hard, though. I'm just curious, how many people have ever played Monopoly? Raise your hands. Just let me see. Oh, bunch. Look at that. Nearly everybody's played. Even some of you guys. That's good. I think there's an online version, actually. It's not surprising that that many people have played it. Um, it it's been around since 1935. And since 1935, it has been played... Uh, over a billion times. I don't know who counted that or how they figured it, but that's what they say. It's been licensed, Monopoly was licensed in 103 countries. It's been published in 37 languages. Parker Brothers was the first to distribute the game, but initially they declined to pick it up because here's what they said. They said, it takes too long to play. The, <laughs> the the rules are complicated, and there's no clear goal for the winner. Now, I've got to tell you, that doesn't sound like a game to me. That sounds like life, right? It takes a long time. The rules are difficult, and way too often there is no clear goal. That's life for a lot of folks. Monopoly was actually not intended originally to be a diversion anyway. It was designed to teach a particular economic principle developed in the 19th century by a guy named Henry George. He was an economist who believed that monopolies, which was kind of the big thing back then, he believed that monopolies were destroying the country and that wealth creation by the masses was, was, was a much better economic model. And so this game was developed to teach that economic principle which likely, likely explains the answer to this next question. Now, here's the part where I'm taking a real risk because I don't know how this is going to turn out, okay? So we saw how many of us have played Monopoly. Here's the second question, audience participation by raising hands. How many of you enjoyed playing Monopoly? And notice the question, you enjoyed the game, not spending time with people. So let me just see the hands of people who enjoyed playing Monopoly. Okay, that's what I thought. Honestly, I was a little nervous because this is a bunch of engineers, and you guys sometimes enjoy things that normal people are like, <laughs> like math, right? Here, I'm so glad to see that so few of you enjoyed it, and those of you did, I have a question, one more question. What is wrong with you? It is a horrible game that is the worst game ever. There's a, there was a survey done by a game board association. They have these things. They did a survey, and they asked all of their members to rate 10,000 games. Out of 10,000 board games, Monopoly was number 20 from the bottom. 
That's because it's a horrible game. The goal of Monopoly is to grind your opponents down one roll of the dice at a time. And in the end, the winner is the one who has driven everybody else into bankruptcy, has amassed everything else to him or herself. This is nothing more than a consumption competition and to, and to see who can accumulate and consume the most. Godless, demonic, evil game. <laughs> Which again, sounds a lot like the way a lot of people live their lives in terms of our resources, our money. We view our resources, our homes, our money, our possessions, like our cars. These are, for a lot of folks, maybe it's not you, okay? But remember what we said earlier, that greed is, doesn't show up in the mirror? For a lot of folks, that's how they live. And in, and in the end, the one with the most wins, which make, makes life just as horrible as the game. So what we need is a new perspective. We need to see things differently, which is exactly what Jesus is talking about in the middle verses that we read a minute ago, beginning around verse 22, verses 22 and 23, that, that really weird part, the hard to understand part where he says, if your eyes are healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? That is a really weird thing to say right there. I mean, if you took out those two verses, if you took those two verses out of Jesus' sermon, then the passage would honestly make a lot more sense. Because verse 21 ends, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then verse 24 picks up, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or devote, be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. That really just kind of flows until you realize that what Jesus is talking about in verses 22 and 23 is not an eye problem at all. He's talking about a perspective. It's not whether we can physically see things. He's talking about how we view life. Specifically, he's talking about how we see money and possessions that and, and the money and money and, and the possessions that money can buy. He's talking about your outlook. The word healthy. Some of your uh, versions will say good um, or single in some of your versions. That's because that word's kind of hard to pin down. It's a Jewish idiom. The word healthy is, it comes from a in, in Greek comes from a Jewish idiom that suggests a generous outlook, kind of a, a perspective that sees possessions as things to be received with gratitude and shared joyfully. It, it open-handed would be a good synonym or, or eyes, a, 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 an eyes wide open perspective. You kind of see the world and people and things uh, as things to be shared with others. The word unhealthy, it's going to be bad in some of your translations, uh, implies a stingy outlook, one that views possessions as things to be kept, sort of a closed fist idea, uh, guarded, used just for self. Which is why Jesus actually begins this conversation with, do, with the phrase, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. We always focus on the on earth part, but the yourselves part is just as important. Jesus is, is saying, don't, don't look at your possessions, don't look at your money as, as it's, it's all just about you. Don't have that, that closed vision, that closed outlook. So there's a question lurking underneath Jesus' words here about healthy and unhealthy perspectives on wealth and here's the question I think he's asking do you have an open-handed outlook an open-eyed perspective on your possessions or are your eyes sort of closed off to what's going on around you do you hold your possessions loosely or do you hold them with a white knuckled grip now you're if you're like me I think you're probably leaning in the direction of an answer 
You're having this internal dialogue. Do I, do I grip my possessions tightly? Do I have a closed outlook? Is my perspective okay? Is Jesus talking to me? And if you're, if you're like I am, I, when I read this, I kind of lean toward, you know, I'm, I'm really doing okay. I think I'm doing okay. So what I want to ask you to do is what I asked me to do earlier this week. I, I Hit the pause button just a minute. Let's talk about the sea we swim in. Let's talk about our culture for just a minute. There is an entire industry in our culture whose mission statement is, is simply this. We are here to create discontent. Hebrews 13.5 says that you and I are supposed to be content with what we have, but there is this huge, well-funded juggernaut of an industry that's trying to undermine our obedience to that command. Global advertising revenue in 2016 was $532 billion. It's projected to reach $590 billion this year in 2017. Product and service companies spend hundreds of billions of dollars every year to create not a product, but an emotion. They want to create desire. They are willing to spend so much money because they know that the line between I want it and I need it is remarkably thin. And you've crossed that line before. You have. So have I. You've been in a store or you've been browsing online and you saw something you didn't even know existed. You didn't know there was such a thing. You saw it and you went, I didn't know there was such a thing. And you went from, I didn't know there was such a thing, to I got to have it in 60 seconds because of desire. You and I are assaulted by hundreds and hundreds of ads every day, market-researched ads designed to make us discontented with our pathetic poorly appointed, sad, little, ill-equipped lives. But that's not the half of it. What if you can't afford the thing that you suddenly realize you can't live without? Do you have to live with that discontent? Do you have to live in the desert of that unfulfilled longing? Of course not. There is another industry designed to help you buy the things you desire even if you can't afford them. The credit industry. Right now, Americans are $12.7 trillion in debt. $12.7 trillion in debt. Nine of that is in mortgage debt. Nine trillion is in mortgage debt. 1.3 is in student loans. Another trillion is in auto loans. 800 billion is in credit cards. The consumer culture is always asking you, why in the world would you put off buying something you want when all you have to do is borrow from tomorrow to have it today? But wait, there's more. What are we going to do with all the old stuff that we've replaced but don't quite want to get rid of because we might need it later? Let's build bigger barns. We'll just store it. In 2013, which is the most recent time I could find data on this, there were over 48,000 mini warehouses in the U.S. I think 30,000 of those are on Memorial Parkway <laughs> South. That translates to 2.3 billion square feet. Enough to warehouse every man, every woman, and every child in the country. Self-storage took in $24 billion four years ago. The self-storage industry asks this question, why would you deaccumulate when you can keep your treasures forever? So if you have a healthy perspective on your possessions, if you got it all under control, you're a better swimmer than most of us. Because the, the cultural current is flowing in a different direction. The world we live in is set up to blind us to the nature of money and possessions. We are conditioned to crave more than we need, 
to define success using numbers and to measure our value by the abundance of our possessions. That's how the culture sets us up. So I want to I ask you seven questions. And I ask myself these questions. At least I've been arguing about these questions all week. All right? Arguing is not right. We've been having a spirited household conversation. That's a euphemism. Okay? We've been talking about this. And these questions are, were, were very uncomfortable with, for me. And I don't like to share, be in misery by myself. So I'm going to let you be in misery with me. Okay? Seven questions. Question number one. Do I... Do I need numbers to define happiness? Do I need to use numbers to define happiness? If, if my happiness is, to, is defined by my income, determined by my income, or the price range, the number of rooms, the square footage of my house, the price tag on my clothes, how much I paid for my car, how new the model year is, if I have to use a number to quantify my happiness, I may have a perspective problem. How about you? Question number two. Am I spending all or more than I earn? This is a question about my um, income to expense ratio. So you and I have got three options about how we're going to live financially. Option number one, you can spend more than you earn. Option number two, you can spend all that you earn. Or option number three is you can spend less than you earn. It's really pretty simple. If I'm spending more than I earn, if I'm spending all that I earn, I probably have a perspective problem. Number three, am I being financially honest? If I had to rank the days of the year in order of my fondness for them, December 25 would be number one, hands down. That's my favorite day of the year, December 25th, Christmas Day. Number two would be whatever Sunday Easter falls on. Number last would be April 15th. April 15th is number 365 out of all the days of the year. You do not, you could not hate paying taxes more than I do. But God calls us to live honest, law-abiding lives. And that goes not just for paying taxes, but for putting in an honest day's work, for an honest day's pay. It means being truthful in business. It means paying what I owe. If I am cheating anybody out of anything in any way, I have a perspective problem. Number four, do I wish my health insurance covered retail therapy? Some of you know what retail therapy is. We're a little backwards at my house. Lisa hates to shop, hates it. She feels about shopping the way I feel about April 15th, okay? I love to shop. If you ever need anybody to go shopping with you, 678-613-3961, call me, text me, I'll meet you, we'll go. I love to shop. So I totally get it when somebody says, I need some retail therapy. I just got to go buy something and I'll feel better. But then I got to ask myself this question. Why is it that I need to buy a thing to feel a feeling? Why do I need to buy something to feel good? If I have to do that, I probably have a perspective problem. Number five, do I buy to win? Do I buy to win. Years ago, when stereo component systems were hot, which was in the early 80s, so a long time ago, I spent money on a system I did not need just so I could one-up a friend who had spent money he did not have on a system he did not need. I bought to win. I was in this little competition like Monopoly. I had a perspective problem. Number six, has my credit card become a necessary extension of my income? In other words, am I borrowing from the future to pay for the present? Am I borrowing from tomorrow to pay for today? I really love using the credit card when I go out. I, it's just so fun to stick it in that little thing and wait and just wait. It's, it's just cool. It's just, technology is amazing just to do that. 
It's really easy to do. But every time you use a credit card that you don't pay off immediately or pay off right that month, you're putting yourself in a prison of debt. It may be a beautiful prison, but you are anything but free. If you're living on your credit card, you may have a perspective problem. Number seven, am I failing to give? I want you to listen really carefully to me on this question, because some of us are not giving at all anywhere. If your family is in a bind right now, the first thing you need to focus on is getting your financial house in order. Take care of your family. Develop a plan to spend less than you earn, to get debt free, and then work that plan faithfully. Once you've done that, then you can begin to use your resources to bless other people. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, 28, that, that the purpose we work and accumulate things is to share with those in need. A lot of us can't do that right now because we're in a situation financially where we can't even take care of our own bills. So the first thing you need to do is focus on that. Take care of your family. Then, once you've got that squared away, then you can use your resources to help others. If your family is in good shape right now, good financial shape, but giving is not a regular spiritual discipline in your life, you have a perspective problem. You just do. Later on this year, in the, in, in the spring, I mean in the fall, um, uh, I think beginning in September on Wednesday nights, we're going to have a, a, a new class focused on this idea of getting our financial house in order, getting it squared away, getting our, our legs back under us. It's called God Owns It All. And I hope you'll be a part of that on Wednesday nights in, in the fall. We want to follow this series up with, a, with something that can actually help us put legs on it. Those are seven questions that I think are really, really challenging. I want you to explore those this week. There's a powerful scene in the movie Schindler's List. Uh, the movie is based on the true story of a man named Oskar Schindler, who was a factory owner in Nazi Germany, who used his wealth to save 1,200 Jewish employees from certain death in Nazi extermination camps. He begged, he borrowed, he did everything. He, he, gave, he gave money to Nazis to try and save folks. Toward the end of the movie, after he's ferried one last group of Jews to safety, He's standing among these 1,200 people, and he looks around and he says, what if I'd made more money? I could have saved more people. And then he looks at his car, and he says, why did I keep this car? This car is worth 10 people. And then he, he looks on, the, on his lapel, and he's got this little lapel pin, and he pulls it off, and he says, this is gold. This is two people, one at least. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. That perspective. Seeing our money and our possessions not as pieces on a game board or a way of keeping store, score or a way of establishing status, but as a way of blessing others. And the way we develop that perspective is by focusing not on what we do or do not have, not on what we have or have not done, but by focusing on Jesus, on who he is and what he has done. He gave up everything he possessed to bless us. You know, in the bulletin, the title of this sermon is The Eyes Have It, and the more I think about that, I'm thinking maybe that shouldn't be the title at all. The title of this should be, What Has Your Eyes? What, what has your eye? What has your focus? If it isn't Jesus, whatever it is, if it isn't Jesus, it isn't enough. So let's do this. Let, let's let this last song, let, let this last song be our theme this week, our goal, our passion. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Let's sing together.
But being down there, I have to tell you, is a perspective change as well for those of you who have been. Um, it always is, no matter how many times you go, it's always a perspective changer. We had a great trip. Uh, the team that we took just did a marvelous, marvelous job serving down there, representing you. A and I have to say how grateful I am uh, for your giving uh, to that mission and for it to continue on. For all, and that, that right there is um, taken from the back of Casa One, looking out at the volcano. Right there, you're at 10,000 feet, and you're looking at 19,000 feet. And it is actually dark when I took the picture, but the sun was still shining on the volcano that night. Beautiful, beautiful country. So many things that are go good going on down there. We have 40 kids at the orphanage and um, 240 kids at the School of Hope. And just a lot of great things. And, and what I'm amazed by, I don't know that we are bringing up brain surgeons or dentists or the next president of Ecuador. Maybe we are, maybe, I don't know. But what I do know about being there in my perspective is there's 40 kids who are warm and who are fed and who are loved and who are being taught about Jesus every day. And otherwise they wouldn't be. So, again, I say to you from that perspective, thank you for your sacrificial giving to that mission. And I can only ask that you would continue to pray and to support all the good things going down there. And I encourage you to go sometime. It's a great trip. Hey, these things as we close. Um, Camp to Know Him is over tomorrow, Jody. And you need to pick up your kids. If you're going to pick them up, be there by 10 because they run us out at 10. If you're picking your kids up here, be back at 1115. Our children's ministry will have a pool day at the home of the Owens. The directions are in uh, the bulletin this morning. So if you want to be a part of that, you can do that. Again, as we mentioned, we really need those elder recommendations to come in. Please get those turned in. Dinner in Devo this week is baked ziti, salad, breadsticks, and dessert. You can get tickets outside in the lobby or call the church office tomorrow. A lot of good things. Thanks for being here. Let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful Dear Lord, we do praise you. Lord, we are so thankful that you love us. And Lord, we uh, struggle sometimes knowing, uh, arguing with you over what is best for us. We just need to give up. Know that you know us best. You created us. And we need to give in and uh, follow your lead, follow your word. Give us strength for that. Give us wisdom for that. We ask your patience with us. But Lord, we also ask for you to challenge us, for you to put people and things in our way that cause us to depend on you and turn to you and rely on you. Uh, may we be a blessing to others because you first loved us. We ask as we go out into the mission field this week, whether it be our streets, our workplaces, or wherever it might be, that uh, we carry you, carry you boldly, and carry you well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.